Alright, if you've clicked on this video, you're probably just like me. You like video games. You may even love video games. The hobby has evolved drastically over the years from a simple pastime to a full-time paying job for a lucky few. Video games have made many people's childhoods and even adulthoods enjoyable, allowing us to escape into a world different from ours for a bit. Whether you're saving the world from a terrible fate, bathing in the blood of your enemies, or just keeping to yourself and building your own world, there's a game out there for everyone. While some games can offer an unbelievable role-playing experience, most games are played because they are fun to play. What makes a game fun to play is a great gameplay loop. While I am unsure of the origin for this term, the first I heard of it was in the Halo 3 documentary. Bungie talks about how you can put as much work as you want into a game, but it will all be for nothing if that 30 seconds of gameplay loop is not enough for the player to enjoy. Something that is painfully obvious in this documentary is how passionate each person is about their job. The way I see it, these people were players of the games themselves, so it was even more important for them to make it a fun experience. These developers of Old Bungie would get together to play the game that they had been developing, and it looked like they had an absolute blast doing so. In my opinion, the success of Old Bungie was in their passion. They wanted to add things into the game that made their own sessions more enjoyable and fun. They wanted to make the games that they dreamt of when they touched their first controller and saw the potential in this hobby. They wanted to push the boundaries of what is possible in the realm of entertainment, creating opportunities for us to do so as well with additions such as Forge. Then we look at what Halo is today. This is a common trend with gaming, and it is immensely difficult to look at the current state of my favorite hobby. But before we look into the present, let's continue with the past for a bit. What makes a gameplay loop so fun, and what gives it the ability to harvest hours and hours away from its players? To answer these questions, Let's go far into the past and discuss some of the most prominent gaming experiences to date. They let me pick. Did I ever tell you that? Choose whichever Spartan I wanted. You know me. I did my research, watched as you became the soldier we needed you to be. Like the others, you were strong and swift and brave. A natural leader. But you had something they didn't. Something no one saw but me. Can you guess? Luck. Halo 3 is somewhere near the top of the list of my favorite video games of all time. 2007 was such a simple and fun time for the gaming industry, with Halo 3 being a testament to that sentiment. Once again, it is a bit melancholic to see how passionate the developers at Bungie used to be about their games. The gameplay loop of Halo 3 was similar to the previous two Halo games. Your goal was to utilize the sandbox of weapons and vehicles provided to you by the developers in order to defeat your enemies. In the campaign, this works extraordinarily well. There are too many impressive combat sequences in this game to count. From the horrific sights of Floodgate, I can see it crawling, sliding around beneath their skin. Oh. And, the, and, and then they got up, started to talk. Oh God, their voices. Oh God, now make them stop. To the intense action of the Covenant. Halo 3 took you through a vast variety of different scenes with plenty of engaging combat encounters. The campaign of Halo 3 remains my favorite Halo campaign to date, and with the way things are going, I don't see that changing anytime soon. When it comes to multiplayer, like I said earlier, Halo 3 was a game made by gamers who wanted to create the most fun experience they possibly could. They wanted to make a place for them to have fun with their own loved ones, as well as offer such an experience to all players. The core gameplay loop carries over from campaign, but in a more competitive way. Halo 3 is by no means meant to be a fast-paced twitch shooter like how Call of Duty is today. Instead, knowledge of the map and sandbox was held paramount. Aiming is obviously still an important factor, but back in the day, the only way to play was on Xbox 360, so you did not have to worry as much about being out-aimed by mouse players. That is not to say controller players cannot be better than mouse players, but the point is that Halo 3's high skill ceiling 
was attributed to how well you could utilize the sandbox and how well your team could control and use the power weapons. There were so many fun game modes such as Griffball or Infected and the implementation of Forge and custom games allowed the community to really go crazy. Along with this was the rewards given to you, which were all cosmetic. Certain feats would give you achievements, which would in turn give you different armor pieces. One of the most famous being the Hayabusa armor, which you could acquire by finding all the skulls in the campaign. Also, there was the Recon armor set, which you could get by making a highly rated forge map. These achievements gave a certain wow factor to the armor they unlocked, as there was no way to purchase or get around set achievements. You either earned the armor, or you stuck with the default armor. I wish more games nowadays emphasized such a system, since it was so cool to see someone with high boost armor and think to myself, Oh wow, he got all the skulls? I could only find like two of them. Obviously this was back in a day when I did not know how to use YouTube or look up guides, but you know what I mean. When it comes down to it, the games made in this era just felt more packed with care. While there were plenty of janky games during this time, successful franchises were able to become successful as a direct result of the passion instilled within every line of code, texture, and sound made by the developers. Terraria is a game that was released all the way back in 2011. While it was much more simple in its early days than it is now, the gameplay loop was still there, and even today it has yet to stray far from its origins. A Terraria playthrough today is not very fundamentally different from its release. You start in a world which you know nothing about, with a guide who can give you advice on what you should do next in your journey. At this point in your Terraria journey, the world is shrouded in mystery, and every sight is new to you. This feeling of exploration is truly fun and meaningful because each new discovery will progress you further in your journey. From finding your first crystal heart to seeing a meteorite land for the first time, every single thing you see in the game leads you to wonder what else might be out there. The absolute core of Terraria gameplay is exploration, but what is even more alluring is the combat. If you've never played Terraria before, you're probably looking at this gameplay and thinking to yourself, What the fuck makes this so special? How can 2D combat be any fun? Fuck. Damn it. Well, all I can really say to you is that if you do not think this looks fun, you obviously have never played Terraria. No, but in all seriousness, Terraria's combat mechanics are nothing too crazy. The main combat encounters are with bosses, which are linked to the core gameplay mechanics revolving around exploration. When you fight your first boss of the game, the Eye of Cthulhu, it is a truly strange experience. It is such a well done boss fight in that it is simple, making it great for the introductory experience for bosses. If it is your first time playing, you likely will not know how to spawn the Eye of Cthulhu. So when you see the text appear stating that you feel a strange presence watching you, you're filled with dread. What the hell could that mean? Why am I scared all of a sudden in this 2D sandbox game? Why do I hear boss music? This is what Terraria is all about. The loop of finding new weapons and new resources to use in crafting is truly addicting. You're rewarded thoroughly for your efforts, so when you beat the boss that has been stumping you, an entire new world opens up. The earliest example of this is Skeletron, who, when defeated, opens up the dungeon, which is an entirely new area of the map to explore. This is why I've sunk so many hours into the game, and also why I can call this one of my favorite games of all time. I highly recommend this experience for anyone who has never played. It is a fantastic example for what makes a great gameplay loop. Similar to Terraria, it can be argued that Skyrim's gameplay revolves around exploration. However, there are plenty of other elements that go into Skyrim which make it such a unique and interesting experience. As a person who has beaten Skyrim multiple times, each new playthrough has had me exploring and discovering new things that I was never aware of in the previous playthroughs. There's so much to uncover in the world of Skyrim that it can honestly feel daunting at times. What makes the experience even more interesting is the skill system. 
which coincides with exploration of the many gameplay mechanics present within the game. When you explore in Skyrim, you're rewarded thoroughly. The rewards you accrue consist of two main categories, experience and loot. The leveling system in Skyrim, though it has many flaws, admittedly, is a serious driving force behind player engagement. There's so many skills which can enhance your gameplay experience, granting you a degree of power with each skill point. The more you explore in Skyrim, the more skill points you will acquire as a result of your many combat encounters. Looking at the combat today, it could seem dated and floaty, but the progression you feel as your character becomes more and more powerful is always present. Whether you choose to be a stealth archer, a battle-crazed warhammer swinger, or a master of the arcane arts, there's a wealth of different weapons, armor sets, and spells that you can utilize in order to become even more powerful. As you level up, unique enemies will start to spawn in more often, meaning you will need as much power as you can find. The gameplay loop of Skyrim is engaging because it rewards you for exploring and making new discoveries. Even if you find some random cave with no crazy story going on in it, you're incentivized to go in because of the gameplay loop. You will likely find enemies, which will level you up and give you skill points, which will let you better utilize the loot that you find later in the cave. It is very addicting, which is why you will often find people commenting, fine, I'll do another playthrough of Skyrim under any video that even mentions the game. Once again, this is a fantastic experience, which I would recommend to anyone who enjoys the hobby of gaming. All right, guys, strap in. This is one of my favorite games. How Warframe is still going strong to this day is an absolute wonder to me. To start off, Warframe was released to the public in 2013. In its original state, the game was barren and without much to do. The gameplay could be described as fun, but a massive complaint at the time was the extremely repetitive missions and drought of content. Despite it being fun, there was just not too much to do at release. Luckily, Warframe today is not even comparable to the state that it launched in. Given 10 years to grow, Warframe has blossomed into a game with the complete opposite problem of its launch. Now, there is so much content in the game that it is daunting for new players. This is certainly not a worse problem to have, as there are plenty of diehard fans such as myself who will sink plenty of time into the game. To be clear, this is my most played game of all time without anything else really coming close. I spent an unfathomably large amount of time in this game. Now, why might I have such a high playtime? Well, you guessed it, it's the gameplay loop. The Warframe has gone through extraordinary changes through the 10 year cycle, but one thing that has remained is its core gameplay loop. What is so interesting about this loop in particular? Since it is difficult to put into words why this game has the ability to suck hours away from me, maybe it would be easier to instead show you one of the many items in the game that hooked me for hours on its own. Let's take a look at one of the many Warframes, Necros Prime. Now, when Necros was first shown off at Tenocon 2018, I was absolutely enthralled by this Warframe. I thought it was the coolest shit I had ever seen up to that point in my life. Even cooler than Valkyr's ginormous ass. Because of this, I was absolutely hellbent on grabbing this Warframe as soon as I could. Nothing could stop me from having this angel of death in my inventory. Not sleep, not hunger, not thirst, not lust, and finally, after cracking relic upon relic upon relic. I had all the pieces to form this magnificent beast. After throwing as much cloth physics onto him as I possibly could, I was finally content. That is, until a new form of power came along. Back in 2018, I thought Necros looked cool, and so I wanted to farm for him. For the most part though, the goal of Warframe was to find the most powerful, world-destroying weaponry you could get your hands on, and use it to find even more power. My most recent grind, for example, 
was to get the Incarnon adapter from my Latron Prime. An Incarnon adapter is an item part of a newer update which turns older, low damage, no AoE, unused weapons, such as the Latron, into freaks of nature which can nuke an entire room with one singular shot. What did I need to do in order to get this weapon? Well, I had to use the weapons I had acquired over my thousands of hours of gameplay in order to survive the Steel Pass circuit, a new roguelike game mode, and then it was as simple as getting through the Incarnon challenges and slapping some mods onto it. Boom. Now I can make my kill count go up even faster. Warframe incorporates things like cosmetics, power, fun, movement, and resource rain into its gameplay loop in order to provide incentives for playing the game. It is just so indescribably fun to me that I continue to check back in after each update comes in order to get the newest items. One thing I haven't mentioned at all in this section, you know that room nuke I was talking about a few seconds ago? Yeah, this one, which is likely one of the most powerful items in the entire game. You can get it without spending a single penny. The entire game is free to play. There's no demo, no paid DLC. I'm looking at you, Destiny 2. No pay to win, none of that. While it can be argued that you can pay to win faster because there are some things such as weapon crafting that can be sped up with premium currency. And yes, if you want to make things go even faster than that, you can buy weapons and warframes for real world money. None of that is necessary. Also, things like mods are necessary in order to make a weapon good, which you need to play the game to get. Part of the fun and allure of this game is to keep grinding while you wait for a new weapon to finish building only to finally grab it and see how much more efficient it is than your previous loadout. Since the gameplay itself is so fun, I did not mind that it took longer for me to craft things than if I had spent a ton of money on the game. The last time I spent money on Warframe was when they released an armor effect to celebrate one of the Tenocons and I thought it looked cool. Before that, I spent money when my grandma gave me a Steam gift card back in like 2016, but anyways, my point is, this is yet another game you should check out. And if you need a carry, you know how to call, buddy. When it comes to the modern era of gaming, it has become a sort of diamond in the rough scenario. Nowadays, there's a sea of bad games and dying franchises in which you can find greatness floating around randomly. Franchises like Halo, which had a 100% accuracy from the three, immediately turned into something different upon shifting developers. The magic at that point was gone. With the release of Halo 4, the franchise took a turn for the worse, and a similar sentiment could be found among a plethora of different franchises, such as Fallout, for example, with the release of Fallout 76. While it has become hard to be positive in the current landscape, games such as the next one give me a little bit of hope for the future. Let's fucking go, Ultra Kill, baby! This game and Neon White are two of the main reasons why I like Breakcore now. Anyways, for this section, let's start off with a more modern game that does it right. Ultra Kill is a retro movement shooter which revolves around the three phrases, mankind is dead, blood is fuel, hell is full. Basically, being close to the enemies you damage is the only way to heal. The gameplay loop of a new Ultra Kill player goes as follows. Enter the level, find new weapons, use those weapons to kill enemies, find synergies between weapons, use those synergies to get through the level as quickly as possible, and repeat. The more you play the game, the more you find crazy things to do, such as slam storing, shotgun boosting, the different methods of insta-killing enemies, coin meleeing, ultra ricocheting. There are just too many ways to play the game to incorporate into this video. This is what I enjoy about games like Ultra Kill. It's a game that is meant to be broken down and dissected in order to fully utilize all of these different synergies. I'm glad to see that the passion of game development is still alive, at least in independent developers. Payday 3, okay, so I've made an entire video on this topic and I would recommend that you check that out if you want to hear more from me about it. But I'll use Payday 3 as a sort of introduction into the bad aspects of modern gaming. Payday 3 is a prime example of why games today feel so different from the past. The problems with Payday 3 all boil down to one simple thing. The game does not feel rewarding to play. In Payday 2, you'd be shown how much money you just made by tossing a bag into your car, and you'd be given a bonus reward at the end of the heist as well as XP and money reward, depending on how many bags you secured and how high the difficulty was. In Payday 3, there's no notification for throwing bags into your van, there's no XP reward for heists, and the bags you secure are worth nearly nothing. The only way to level up is to finish challenges, which are mostly tied to weapons, 
which you likely do not want to use. The core gameplay loop of Payday 2 felt fun and rewarding, whereas Payday 3 feels like more of a chore than anything. And this sentiment is common within the gaming industry of modern days. Again, go check out my other video if you would like to see me go more in depth on this topic. Now, to be clear, I think that Tiny Tina's Wonderland suffers the same fate for the most part as Borderlands 3. Fun gameplay loop and interesting loot packed with a horrendous story and lacking endgame. The gameplay loop of Wonderlands is similar to other games in the Borderlands franchise. There's a large amount of randomly generated weapons along with a small amount of legendary weapons with special properties. Enemies drop a very high volume of loot as well as experience, which will allow you to progress in your skill tree. The main allure of the Borderlands franchise's gameplay is the vast amount of guns and cool legendaries. In Wonderlands, however, it feels like many of the legendaries are underpowered compared to a select few. Also, some character types were severely underpowered when it came to endgame, which is a mistake that can render hours and hours of gameplay irrelevant if you're interested in the endgame. At launch, Wonderlands remained fun until my brother and I unlocked the Chaos Chamber, which is essentially the endgame of Wonderlands. The Chaos Chamber is a series of levels with random enemies and effects. It is a roguelite in that you can use temporary currency in order to increase certain stats for the current session of that chamber. Once you fail or leave the chamber, these bonuses go away, and at the end of the chamber you can spend that same temporary currency on any loot type of your choosing. The higher the chaos level of the chamber, the better the rewards. While there's nothing inherently wrong with the chaos chamber, the way they went about implementing it is somewhat tedious and frustrating. In order to upgrade your chaos level, you have to do a special chamber called a chaos trial. This is cool and challenging, and I really enjoyed this system at launch. The reason I enjoyed it at launch is because while it was somewhat difficult, me and my brother managed to reach the maximum chaos level of 20 with relative ease. That is, until they increase the cap to 35, and then again to 50. At this point, leveling up your chaos rank was a matter of using the most meta, annoying methods of playing the game possible, which are pixie guns. Basically, pixie guns are guns you throw when reloading, and they shoot for you. There was a skill synergy which made these guns do insane amounts of damage. The thing is, my brother's base class was a stabomancer, whereas I was a spell shot. Spellshot was by far the most overpowered base class, whereas Stabomancer did not seem to feel that way at all, as I was carrying him through the levels and watching him die over and over. The guns and builds that we came up with, which were great for the normal game, were no longer enough, meaning we had to look up YouTube guides in order to progress any further. By the time they released Chaos Level 100, where you would have to do one trial for every Chaos Level past 50, we didn't even bother. Along with this, the DLC for Wonderlands was absolute garbage. Since the base game was full of unique levels and a blast to play through, we expected the DLC to be just as diverse and fun. Gearbox released four DLCs for Wonderlands, that's four chances to get it right. And what did they consist of? Each DLC consisted of just a couple new rooms for the Chaos Chamber, and some new legendaries. So we went from the fantastic DLC of Borderlands 2, which offered hours and hours of new content and cool items such as Sword Explosion. Here, take my sword gun. Oh man! But what if the sword you shoot explodes and then turns into three smaller swords? Which then explode? It will be like a sword explosion! Tina, make Roland's gun do the things I just said! Okay. to a couple of new rooms and bosses. Even if you put all the Wonderlands DLC into one singular package, it wouldn't compare to the DLCs of its predecessors at similar price points. Tiny Tina's Assault and Dragon Keep, which is where the idea for Wonderlands came from, was only $10. This is one of my favorite DLCs of all time. Then you look at Coiled Captors for Wonderlands, which is also $10. Coiled Captors adds one boss and ten new legendary items, of which many are not that great in my opinion. Also, future orange here, um, while I was getting gameplay for this video, I managed to finish Coiled Captors in literally 12 minutes. So, yeah. Dragon Keep added an entire new campaign as well as gemstone weapons and tons of new unique and legendary items for the same price. The gameplay loop of the endgame within Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is very tedious. It rewards you by giving you more levels to grind through until you eventually give up and stop bothering. It is honestly not worth the time in my opinion, which is a shame to see when the base game is quite enjoyable. I'm just frustrated that my experience with this game was soured by greed in an attempt to sell us less content for the same price. 
Ah, uh, Halo Infinite. Though it is admittedly improving with time, Halo Infinite feels like a shell of what Halo used to be. The art style has been dropped from what made a Halo game look like a Halo game. Everything looks plastic and sterilized. The teen rating makes it less gritty and serious. While these things are important, what is more apparent is the changes made to the gameplay loop. While I've talked about the campaign of Halo 3 in great detail, I'm gonna be focusing on the multiplayer side of Halo Infinite. To be honest, Halo Infinite's campaign was serviceable. I had fun with it, but the AI just isn't that good. The grappling hook broke a lot of encounters, and I think it would be a sin to compare it to Halo 3 in any meaningful way. The story side of it, again, is just completely barren, and it, it's just so generic. So yeah, I'm gonna be focusing more on the multiplayer side of it for Halo Infinite. The gameplay of Halo Halo Infinite is not necessarily the issue with the game, since it is actually quite fun. While I wish we could go back to the retro days of Gandhi jumping and crouch jumping through the map, it seems like sprinting is here to stay within this franchise going forward. Aside from that personal issue I have, a more widespread problem is that of hit registration. I was behind the wall, was I not? Every time I come back to the game, it feels immensely strange to see my bullets hitting enemies without actually doing damage. This has been a prominent issue within the game since launch, and has made it difficult for me to get back into. Now for the progression system of Halo Infinite. While Halo 3 did not have hundreds of cosmetics to unlock, the ones that were available were, well, cool to the point that people would go through the many different challenges in order to acquire those armor sets. It felt rewarding to show off what you had accomplished within the game to other players. Today, it seems like that idea is almost completely gone from video games altogether. Halo Infinite is not exactly immune to this phenomenon. In this title, 343 Industries has opted to revolve their rewards around seasonal battle passes. Honestly, just hearing the word battle pass is exhausting at this point. The way you've progressed through each battle pass level is with daily and weekly challenges as well as completing matches. For a considerable amount of time after the launch of the game though, match experience was not even a thing. And once you completed your daily and weekly challenges, there was no way to further progress for the day. The community was extraordinarily vocal about how slow the process was, yet it took them almost an entire year to reward you for completing a match. This is absolutely unbelievable, and I simply cannot understand why developers keep making this decision. It's the same way with the release of Payday 3, where you only get experience from completing challenges. Many theorize that this is a scheme by the developers to increase playtime, but the way I see it, I'm not going to be playing any game that doesn't respect my time. I have 56 hours within Halo Infinite and I still have yet to complete the first battle pass. I commend 343 Industries for not making battle passes time gated, but who cares if it is going to take so damn long to complete one? While I understand that most people play games just for the gameplay and could not give a single shit about cosmetic rewards, it is still an important part of the gameplay loop, which, if used correctly, can keep players coming back for years to come. When it comes to Call of Duty, there is no shortage of rewards to sift through. With 450 levels, soon to be increased to 650 I think, there's plenty to ward towards with battle passes and weekly challenges coming out quite often. Though the battle passes are pretty maliciously priced, there is another form of rewards when it comes to Call of Duty. What I'm going to be focusing on for a bit is a more intangible reward, being your hidden matchmaking rating. For the most part, I usually only play Call of Duty when my friends are online. Whenever we do play together, we see a pretty strange phenomenon. For context, we're pretty decent at Call of Duty. I usually play with Cooper. Why it takes so long to turn off a fucking light? Sorry. And Dominic. <laughs> and we get pretty good ratios in each game for the most part. Now, we aren't necessarily great players by any means, but I'm alright with snipers and such. What gets really annoying during our sessions is the teammates we get paired with all the time. We primarily play Search and Destroy because it's fun to talk shit and all that, but it's difficult sometimes when the teammates we get are absolutely atrociously fucking horrible. Why a grenade launcher? Because I'm getting good with it, guy. Believe in me. We're planting at Bravo. Yeah. I don't. Whether they're aiming at the floor or just straight up not playing the game, we've noticed a trend with our teammates. Since we usually do somewhat well as a group, it seems like the fucks over at COD want to even the odds and give us teammates who don't even know how to press the fucking sprint button. Looking at our leaderboards from past games, we can see that the three of us tend to do quite well, 
whereas our teammates are complete trash cans. This is a major issue with the modern competitive landscape. Another example of this phenomenon is back over in Halo Infinite. Min Blitz is an extraordinarily skilled Halo player. He talks about his experience on Twitter where, in a game of big team battle, his seven teammates did not come even close to the amount of kills he got. It's very disheartening to see that doing well in the game will guarantee that your fun in the next few games is diminished. Games which used to be beacons of community interaction and competition have now become engagement farms, putting player retention above all else at the expense of an actually good matchmaking experience. AAA game studios of the modern day feel way too much like corporations, when there used to be people who were passionate about games being given the opportunity to make them. Older franchises like Payday, Borderlands, and Halo are starting to feel empty and lifeless. Some would argue that older franchises such as Halo need to be put to rest at some point, as a result of their old age, but I would argue otherwise. For example, let's look at a successfully revived franchise. I warned you. Finally. Before 2018, I had never even heard of God of War. With the release of the reboot, it had been five years since the last entry in the God of War series. Obviously, the reboot has totally revitalized the franchise and made it much more popular. If you asked me who the main character of God of War was before 2018, I would have said, Boy, I do not know. I do not know. Anyways, um, this is a fantastic example of how a game studio has kept their franchise alive for almost two decades. All of the modern games I've spoken on, minus Ultra Kill, have been either sequels or just part of an already existing franchise, none of which have been able to share in the success story of God of War. Payday 3 offers little to do, which is why Payday 2 has such a high what player count in comparison. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is a great iteration gameplay-wise, but the story has continued to devolve into a cringe fest like Borderlands 3. Halo, which used to be the absolute pinnacle of gaming with a peak of 1 million players at once in Halo 3, is now a shell of its former self, opting to slowly release its staple features as content updates over the course of its life cycle. What makes a game fun is its gameplay loop, and all gameplay loops have some form of progression, whether the progression is cosmetic, loot-based, or even just the development of the player's skills. The games of today see their players as numbers, that's all just a means to make their product look more promising to shareholders. No longer is the player experience paramount. Instead, we live in a day where game publishers push out games when they are far from ready and force their developers to update the games over the course of years in order for them to finally become what they were meant to be. It's difficult to remain optimistic for the future of my favorite hobby when the industry continues to go in the direction of live service gaming. So. While I hope for the state of AAA gaming to settle back into selling games as products rather than services, independent games are really the way to go at the moment while I wait for games like Payday 3 to implement the features that they should have had at launch. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you gleaned something interesting from the video, and if you did, let me know what you thought in the comments section. There were a ton of really insightful and interesting takes in the comments section of the Payday 3 video I made. So just know I read all the comments and enjoy listening to your takes. Once again, thanks for taking the time to check out my content. Hope you have a great day. I'll just ramble on for a second here. Um, for my next video, I'm planning on taking on a topic that all of us can relate to. So stay tuned for that. Sorry this one took so long to make. I've been a little sick. Maybe you can tell in my voice. But um, hey, maybe you like it even more. Maybe it makes my voice deep and soothing.